Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. And to those watching on NASA TV, welcome to our home. My name is Maria Santos, and I am the chair of the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance, also known as OLA, here at NASA headquarters. We are an employee resource group, and our vision is to serve as a resource for NASA employees and, and agency leaders, and to build cross-cultural awareness and an inclusive environment for all employees. This is actually the second federal board that I've led in the last five years. I was recently asked why. Why do I continue to do this type of work? I do it because I believe in the power of diversity and inclusion. Diversity in ideas, race, ethnicity, backgrounds, and experiences sparks curiosity, creativity, and innovation. And NASA knows a little bit about doing just that. It is actually at the heart of our mission. Diversity is basically accepting and acknowledging differences. Um, it builds an opportunity for dialogue. And inclusion, well, to be included basically means to be part of a community, to belong, to feel that you exist, to feel that you are seen, that you are part of something bigger than yourself. We should not only experience this in our homes, but also in our communities, and especially in our workplace. Hispanics call this estar en familia, to be with family. Today you will hear from Diana Trujillo and Jose Hernandez, two amazing members of our NASA familia. We decided to call our program Aspira con NASA, Aspire with NASA, but that was only after we realized the power of their stories. Two individuals born in different countries with different backgrounds and journeys, but with the same dream. Now, let's get started. I would like to introduce you first to Mrs. Krista Paquin. Ms. Paquin is the Associate Administrator for NASA's Mission Support Directorate. She is responsible for the integration of agency-wide mission support, NASA headquarters, uh, NASA headquarters operations, NASA partnerships, and Space Act agreements, among other things. So basically, she's kind of a big deal. Prior to joining headquarters, she spent four years in the private sector, and prior to that, 22 years at our Goddard Space Flight Center in various leadership roles. We at OLA, of course, call her our champion. In her role as champion, she not only coaches and advises us, but also encourages us and also advocates for us uh, when it comes to employee development, diversity and inclusion, employee, employee and career development, employee engagement, so on and so forth, and also special programming like the one here today. She's quick to ask me, how can I help? Do you need anything? And as busy as she is, you know, helping to run an agency and all, not once has she told me she's too busy or that she can't meet with me. And I am grateful for her leadership, friendship, and support. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming NASA's Associate Administrator for Mission Support, Ms. Krista Paquin. I don't think I need this stool, but I'll take it. I feel pretty good being a little bit taller today. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so, so much for joining us, uh, and welcome. Uh, I want to especially welcome uh, the students. I think we're expecting a group of students to join us today, and I hope that they just feel comfortable coming on in when they arrive. Um, we hope that our students will be inspired by today's program and leave here with a dream to reach new heights in their lives and aspire to be a part of America's space program the world looks to us for leadership in space. When Charlie goes out and Al Condes goes out and talks to other, um, other international space organizations, they, they are very clear in the fact that they look to us. And the success of our program is dependent on leveraging the talents and diversity of our country. And so I hope that the students of today see themselves in our future and they're part of our team that will put boots on Mars. It's an exciting future and we hope that you aspire to be a part of it. The Hispanic community is the fastest, come on in, join us, 
is the fastest and largest growing minority population in the United States. And we really, truly need our Hispanic youth to aspire to be a part of our program for us to succeed in our mission. After all, NASA has been the best place to work in government for the last four years in a row. If you don't know that, it's very important to understand why we engage our workforce. We're here today because we're committed to engaging our workforce, our diverse workforce, and being a part of our future and enabling all of us to succeed. The OLA Group has put together an outstanding program. I want to thank Maria and the team for their commitment, their passion, their hard work. Um, they understand community service, and their service is not just to NASA headquarters, but they've been out working in the communities. They've been painting schools. They've been meeting with other federal, uh, other federal leaders uh, in the Hispanic community to bring together that community, and that takes a lot of energy. These are other duties as assigned, and uh, they do it with a commitment and an energy and enthusiasm that I think is a model for many of us. And so if any of you in the room have not been able to find the time yet to join the group, I encourage you to carve out some time after today and join the team. I don't think you'll be disappointed. You know, my belief in community service, um, I love this quote from Muhammad Ali, uh, service to others is the rent you pay for the space you, you live in on this earth. And so it, we have an obligation. My father taught me at a young age that we have an obligation to engage. We are very fortunate to be a part of this country. And, uh, and so service to each other, service to NASA, service to our community is vital. And thank you, Ola, for the work that you do. So I'm going to quickly review the agenda today. Uh, we have a very, very exciting program. And um, I'm very excited to hear from our speakers. First, we're going to hear, uh, before our speakers come up, we're going to hear a brief video from Charlie Bolden. Um, and I'll mention him in a moment. I'll give a couple of opening remarks. And then we'll hear from Diana Trujillo and Jose Hernandez, uh, both with their personal stories. We'll have some time for Q&A. I don't think we'll be able to open the Q&A up uh, NASA-wide, but for folks in the room, we'll be able to take those. And then we're going to hear from Donald James from the Office of Education uh, about our resources that we have available. Uh, McDiel will do our closing remarks and our thank yous at the end of the program. And um, again, I, I thank you all for coming today. So I would like to take a moment to briefly introduce our NASA administrator. If any of you who are not NASA people and have seen The Martian know the director of JPL does not run NASA. <laughs> it is Charlie Bolden, and we call him the administrator, not the director. Uh, Major General Charles Frank Bolden, Jr., we all, by the way, know as Charlie B., uh, has been our administrator now for over seven years. He was appointed by President Obama. He is the longest-serving Obama appointee uh, in the federal government right now. Uh, he retired from the Marine Corps after 30 years, 34 years, I'm sorry, which included 14 years as a member of NASA's astronaut crew. Uh, as an astronaut, he traveled to orbit four times. Uh, aboard the space shuttle, two as commander of two missions, and two as piloting two others. His flights included deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope, one of NASA's flagship missions, and the first joint U.S.-Russian shuttle mission, which featured a cosmonaut as a member of his crew. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Astronaut Hall of Fame, in May of 2006. He came from very modest uh, background. He was born in Columbia, South Carolina, and worked hard, studied hard, and uh, made his way to receive an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. He got a B.A. in electrical science. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and as an aviator in the Navy, he flew more than 100 combat missions in North and South Vietnam. Uh, he earned a Master's of Science degree in systems management. There's a theme here, STEM education, science and math, very important. If you want to be an astronaut, study hard, STEM ghost him, and, um, he, uh, and that's what he'll tell you if you ask him what it takes to be an astronaut to students, study hard and uh, focus on the right, the right experience and background. Um, and as Maria said earlier, he couldn't be here today. Um, she reached out in her leadership role and her confidence in her leadership role to Charlie to ask him if he would say a few words to you all on a video. And so at this point, I'd like to introduce the video. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to NASA headquarters. I'm sorry I can't join you today since I'm out of town, but I know you'll have a wonderful gathering. Today, we're here to honor the diverse and distinct tapestry that is the Hispanic community and to acknowledge and celebrate its contributions to NASA's mission and this country's success. Hispanic employees make up an important part of our workforce. 
and they work in diverse career fields and across all NASA's centers. NASA and our entire nation will continue to rely on them and their contributions in the decades to come as we implement our journey to Mars and make cutting edge breakthroughs in science, technology, and aeronautics. Today, you're in for a real treat. You will get to hear from two outstanding individuals, Diana Trujillo and Jose Hernandez. Their work has benefited and inspired all of us, and they are examples of the amazing talent that fuels this agency. Diana Trujillo's story is one of dedication, perseverance, and drive. She was born and raised in Colombia and moved to the U.S. to study aerospace mechanics and biomechanics. She began her NASA career as an intern at our Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. She and her family moved to Pasadena, California, where she joined our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She is now the mission lead for our Mars Curiosity rover. This mission has inspired millions of students around the globe to join our journey to Mars and is helping pave the way for humans to visit the red planet. Jose Hernandez's story is one of hope, strength, and inspiration. He was born in French Camp, California, the son of migrant farm workers. In the fields, he heard on the radio that NASA had selected its first Hispanic astronaut. That was the moment he decided he too wanted to go to space. Jose would go on to study electrical and computer engineering and spend more than 14 years at the Livermore National Laboratory before joining NASA's Johnson Space Center in 2001. He was admitted into the astronaut candidate program in 2004 and by 2009, Jose had fulfilled his dream of going to space. Jose and Diana's work is allowing NASA to go farther, reach new heights, and in future, reach Mars and beyond. Diversity is essential to our success. Diversity in backgrounds, experiences, and thinking creates and maintains a culture of creativity and innovation essential to NASA. So I want to thank our Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance, HOLA, the group here at headquarters for developing today's program, the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management Division, and our Associate Administrator for Mission Support, Krista Paquin, for their support of HOLA. Now, please welcome and show some real love to Diana and Jose. Can you guys hear me well? Perfect. Okay, so we can go ahead and put my slides if you could please. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's see. Okay, perfect. Okay, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Diana Trujillo, and my job is to explore space. Right now, I'm exploring the planet Mars with the objective of trying to find out if there was ever any life on the surface of this planet. I have the honor of working as a mission lead for the Mars Curiosity rover, an SUV-sized laser beam nuclear power robot that has driven more than 14 kilometers on the surface of this planet. As a mission lead, I have the honor of working with an international team of scientists and engineers, people from different countries, people from Spain, from Russia, people from the USA with the backgrounds from El Salvador, from Colombia, from Mexico. And as a team, we try to figure out what we're gonna do with this mission. What is actually the goal of the mission of the day? Where are we going to explore? Where are we gonna drive? What rocks are we going to drill? What samples are we gonna take? What, what pictures are we gonna bring back home? And it's interesting to me to know that after many years of working on this mission, I have worked approximately seven years now on Mars Curiosity rover, um, my team and I are amongst the first humans to see pictures from another planet on a daily basis. I go to work at 8 in the morning, and at 8.15, I'm looking at pictures of the surface of this incredible planet that nobody has been in before. That, to me, feels like I am sitting in the Enterprise. I feel like I'm sitting in the Enterprise in a huge ship with lots of people with different backgrounds, with different ideas, but with one objective, which is to explore space, to explore the unknown. 
But missions like this don't get built in a week. It took a decade of incredibly hard work and bold decision making, a lot of risk taking as well. People thought that this mission was so crazy and ambitious that it was not gonna happen. In fact, I was in college when this mission was being talked of and I remember hearing about the concept and even I thought, that's crazy, that's never gonna work. And in a way, you can say the same thing about my journey. I was born and raised in Cali, Colombia, a beautiful country full of delicious food, great people, awesome music. But it's not a country that is known for producing women aerospace engineers. You don't hear Colombia. Here is the Colombia NASA equivalent. We don't have something like that. So as a child, to me, it was very hard because my country was going through a lot of terrible violence. And for me, words like hopes and dreams had to be replaced with the word survival, kind of get to school safe. And um, so it was interesting to me because what I wanted to really do was to escape all that terrible violence and instead focus into what I wanted to do, which was space exploration, and not be worried that maybe I was supposed to fit in a role that my culture wanted women to do. Instead, I just wanted to dream bigger and dream beyond what anyone else had told me I could do. So what I tried to do was to find a role model. That was my first step. Let me find a female Colombian, somebody that maybe lives nearby me or somebody that lives in a different city but still in my country that I can ask her, how did you make it happen? How did you manage to get to do the dream job that you have? What should I do? So my parents try to find her. I try to find her. We search, but unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone like that. So instead, what I did was I found comfort on TV. And, <laughs> right. and so <laughs> it is kind of funny and at the same time sad to know that the best resource that I had to figure out what it was like to work for NASA was the guy from my dream of Genie. You know, he will get out of his car, he will walk to this building, which we all knew was NASA, and then you will see his desk, and for me was like, I'm there. I know exactly what a NASA person does. And, um, but yeah, so um, it's interesting because at home I would watch the shows and I would dream about who I wanted to be. And at school I would focus in my science and math classes, which sometimes that doesn't make you very popular with your friends, and then when I was at home, that actually made my parents quite worried. My parents thought that I was setting myself up for a path of disappointment. You know, they didn't know an aerospace engineer. They didn't know what an aerospace engineer does. And when I told them that I wanted to work for NASA or when I told them that I wanted to build rockets, they were very worried. My dad actually, my dad actually told me that he was concerned because maybe what it was gonna end up happening was that I was going to become a car mechanic and that was my best shot. And so, <laughs> so um, although my dad had a different perspective about what my dream should be, we did agree on one thing though. We agreed on the first step. My dad thought that it was a good idea for me to come to the US and learn English. And for me, I knew that I had to leave the country that I loved to go and pursue my dream. So I got 300 bucks that my dad gave me, put it on my pocket, hop on a plane to Miami, and then I got here, and the first challenge I had was the basics. How to speak the language? Where do I want to live? How do I go to school? So uh, I, got, I got enrolled into a community college for English as a second language, and then I also took three jobs to be able to pay for my school. After two years of a lot of struggle, I started to think, you know, Maybe my parents were right. This was a crazy dream. I was having, I was feeling homesick. I want to go back home. I wanted to eat some empanadas. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should just, I should head back. And so I came across actually something that changed what I was thinking. It gave me actually hope. It was an old magazine published by NASA, which it only featured female astronauts. It told me 
where they were from, who were they, what college they went to, what major were they register on, what job they had, and what mission they actually flew in. And in fact, it also told me what they did on the mission. So to me, this was the magazine that gave me all those role models that I was so desperately looking for. I took this magazine and I traced my path with the magazine. I figured out who was doing what, what years they were, what college, so that I could figure out where I wanted to go next. This magazine made me feel way more comfortable about my dream. It actually made me recognize that, hey, there's other women doing this. And hey, I look like some of them too. So maybe I can actually do this. And so instead, uh, I started to, instead of feeling concerned and maybe shy about my dream, I started to share it with everyone. Uh, NASA Academy. The NASA Academy, I think, still working? Okay, thank you. All right, let's switch mic. Okay, so the NASA Academy uh, is a, so it led to the NASA Academy. Applied to the NASA Academy, which was a leadership program that was designed to groom the future leaders of space exploration. It was a very competitive program. Uh, you, thousands of people will apply, 18 people got selected to the main campus, which was Goddard, and out of those 18 in the 2006 class, I was the only Hispanic. In that class, um, we got to see it all, I felt like. We got to meet multiple center directors, we got to meet the NASA administrator, CEOs of companies that will come talk to you, sit down on the floor and tell you how they actually make it happen. We got to meet astronauts as well. We got to actually see a space shuttle launch. All of that in a course of 10, 11 weeks. By the end of this program, I realized that there were so many things out there that I could do. The program showed me all the possibilities that I had. And in fact, I felt like the program change my perspective from an immigrant that had limited possibilities to a person that had infinite opportunities. This program uh, gave me the push that I needed to actually apply to work for NASA. And after I finished the program, I had the, the luck to actually be able to work now with a company that was resupplying the space station. My first job out of college was to work with a company that was doing cargo resupply for, to the space station. And then after that, I was able to work for the Constellation program, which vision was to put humans to the moon and then Mars and beyond. After that, I also worked on the Deep Space Network, which is those big antennas around the world that communicate with deep space missions, and now as a mission lead for the Curiosity Rover. I feel very fortunate to work for NASA, and I feel like for the people that are in this room, if you are not part of NASA or if you are part of NASA, you should feel very excited about it. And you should try to work with us because there's so many cool things going on. In fact, these are like very exciting times right now. The government and the private industry have come together, recognizing that together we can explore space. Together we can do more than any of us could have done individually. And so, it's true, space is really hard, right? Trying to do a space exploration is extremely difficult. But the difference is that if we actually take these big, big challenges and we split them into small pieces, and we have people from different countries, sister agencies, NASA, all of them working together to achieve some of those goals, at the end, it will add up to a lot. And who knows, maybe enough for actually us to take people to Mars in our lifetime. I would like to be able to see people to go to Mars before, before I go away. So let's talk about what has happened so far. Current missions and missions that have already completed are helping us understand Mars even more. They're helping us understand what's happening out there. How are our experiments actually behaving? What are the options that we have when we try to come on a space scrub remotely and then we have an issue? How do we how do we troubleshoot it? How do we respond? How quickly can we do this? All the options, things that we need to start thinking about as a team and also from the vehicle design perspective so that we can actually take people in the future to Mars. And not only that, right? These same missions are working as a test platform for us to test new technology. Technology that needs to help us figure out how are we going to survive in an environment like this? 
how we're going to eat, how we're going to breathe, how we're going to sleep, how we're going to do all of those other things. Just to give you an idea how great we're doing on the surface of Mars right now, Curiosity, within the first year of landing, was able to demonstrate that Mars had suitable environment to support life at some point. That was one of our main mission objectives, and we hit it within the first year of being there. So you can think about what can we actually do if we were to send more vehicles to Mars. We know how to do it. If we were to send more, we could learn more at a much faster rate. And we're not only doing excellent on the surface of Mars, we're also dominating the orbit of Mars. By the end of 2016, we would have had three more spacecraft, ExoMars, MAVEN, and MOM. Three new spacecraft added to the orbit, plus Odyssey and MRO, which are already there. All of those spacecrafts that we need so that we can communicate back to Earth and also look at the entire surface of Mars and figure out where we want to go and where do we want to land and what do we want to do. And how about the guts of the planet? We can learn also a lot about the guts of the planet. By November 2018, we would have put a new spacecraft on the surface of Mars, and that would be INSIGHT, to help us understand how this rocky planet was actually formed. And then we take the next step, Mars 2020, the next step on our search, the next step to help us find out if there are any clues of any microbial life ever that happened in the past ever on the surface of Mars. In addition to that, this mission is going to help us do more technology development and testing. It's going to help us figure out how to produce oxygen out of the, surf out of the atmosphere of Mars. And he's also going to take a sample and encapsulate it and get it ready for the next mission. Our next mission, which is sample return. Sample return is a mission that is very important to the scientist. Very important to the scientist because it's a mission that will decouple the sample analysis that you need to do from the mission constraints. If you bring the sample back to Earth, you can do all sorts of analysis that you want. You can take all the time that you, that you want to. You don't have constraints like power and data and time of day, or how many orbits do we have with the orbiters to send the data back? How quickly can we send it back? That sort of stuff. So if you can actually decouple those two things from the mission constraint and the actual science that you want to do, you can get a lot more out of it. And all of that is actually to help us to take in the future people to Mars. And one thing that I did want to mention about the previous mission is that the sample return mission will have to demonstrate technology that is needed for us to take humans to Mars, such as launching out of the surface of Mars, right? You have to launch out of the surface of Mars. You might actually have to do orbit operations to handle that sample to another vehicle, travel all the way back to Earth, and land safely. All of that technology that we actually need for humans to Mars. I do want to say, though, that uh, robotic operations are paving the way. Robotic operations have helped us understand what's going on with Mars in a way that we never imagined. In fact, we are getting so efficient that we can do dozens of experiments on a single sol. It, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. You can do it at 2 in the morning. You can do it at 1 in the morning. You can do it very early. At any time, you can command the spacecraft. You can tell the spacecraft a series of several thousands of commands, and it will just clock through it and do your analysis. Through the understanding of the rover missions from Viking to Curiosity, Although we have encountered and, and collected a lot of information and understanding, I have to ask myself, would we have actually learned even more if we had put men and women on the surface of this planet? The possibilities are there. We could have. Now, we're not there yet, though. We're not there yet, but the good thing is that we're getting close. The good thing is that I can show you guys these slides with these possible missions, and it's getting closer. We're talking about a finite amount of missions is no longer a one day we will go to Mars. Now we're saying, here are the missions that could help us get to Mars. We're having that discussions now. And while some people will actually be busy exploring Mars, some other people will be busy exploring an alien ocean. Some people will be busy exploring Europa. 
So we have lots of things going on in NASA. But I wanted to leave you guys with this last few thoughts, which is that all of these things that I have shown you guys today and you have heard about it before are all worth doing. These are challenges that we can achieve. Our team, our NASA team, is an incredible team. It's an incredible, incredible team that has actually excel and overcome challenges. The only thing is that we're not very diverse. So science has actually shown us that diverse backgrounds, people with different backgrounds can bring different creativities, different ideas, different approach to solving a problem. And we have a lot of things that we want to do, problems that are really tough. So having people from different backgrounds helping us think outside the box is to our benefit. So I just want to, I want to leave you guys today with the idea or the thought that we should work all together to open the NASA door to include people, individuals, talented, brilliant individuals to come to our agency and help us together explore space, push the boundary, and dare my things. Thank you very much. Okay, um, another round of applause, please, for our amazing colleague here, Diana Trujillo. Now, it's my pleasure to invite um, our next speaker for today, Mr. Jose Hernandez. Thank you, Maria, for... Uh for inviting me here, and I'd like to thank Ola as well for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here. I say back because uh, I did spend a year here uh, out of the Office of Legislative and International Affairs. And so uh, shout out to my coworkers over here that where, where we work together. But um, I, wanna, I wanna quickly uh, start, start my talk because if anything, I wanna leave you guys with the uh, feeling that anything is possible uh, in this planet. And uh, to don't be afraid to dream the impossible, especially uh, the students that are here with us today. Uh, and I think you'll be able to, uh, to relate to my story and uh, hopefully after hearing my story, you'll walk away uh, on cloud nine saying, hey, I could be whatever I want in this world. And my story starts not here, it starts in Mexico. It starts in Mexico uh, with my father and my mother. Uh, they're both from the state of Michoacan, Mexico. Where is that at? You balance Mexico on a pin, center of mass. That's where Mexico's at. I mean, that's where Michoacan is at. And my father started coming to, the con to this country uh, at a very young age. Uh, just like uh, many folks looking for the American dream, he searched for a better life. And so he started a, uh, a, a lifestyle called uh, you know, becoming a migrant farm worker. He would spend nine months here in California and go back home for uh, three months. He started that when he was 15. When he was 18, he met my mother, and they got married when he was 19. And my mother was all of 14 years old. And uh, I guess it was okay in those days. Uh, <laughs> but it's real cute, it's real cute because when my mom hears this story that I tell it, because it's factual, uh, she says, mijo, tell him I was 15. <laughs> like, that's going to make it. I said, ma, still looks bad. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they get married, and, and my mom in, gets incorporated into what I call the California circuit, where my dad would spend uh, two months in Southern California, uh, harvest of the crops, strawberries, move to uh, Central California for the lettuce and hoeing sugar beets for another two months, and then five months in, uh, in Northern California, and then they would go back. Well, the family came along, and they were, uh, we were born, and uh, there's four of us. I'm the youngest of four. Where we were born dictated what month we were born in. I was born in August, so uh, you know that's, that's in the uh, at harvest time. So I was born in our last stop in Stockton, California, and, uh, and right where Ron James and I are from, right? Uh, he's from Stockton, too. So. So I was born in Stockton. I have a brother 
was born in September. He too was born in Stockton, and I have a brother and sister. They were born in November and December. Guess where they were born? They were born in Mexico. As, as we grew, I mean, that was the lifestyle I grew in. It was, uh, it was uh, going to three different school districts uh, and then missing three months of school, although we did get homework from our teachers uh, when we went back to Mexico and we did our homework every day in my grandma's kitchen table with a cup of hot chocolate, piece of French bread, and from 8 to 12, Monday through Friday, we did our homework. That was our, uh, you know, our self-schooling. It wasn't homeschooling, it was self-schooling because my parents only had a third grade education, so they couldn't help us much. Uh, so we did it ourselves. Things did not change for the better until second grade. In the second grade, uh, I had a teacher. Her name was uh, Miss Young. Uh, Miss Young was a young Chinese-American, beautiful teacher, fresh out of college. Uh, did I say she was beautiful? She was beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful teacher, you know, second grade, your first crush, you know, I'm guilty. <laughs> guilty, guilty, guilty. So anyway, um, my dad gets up that November, one week before we go to Mexico, as is customary, he would make a big announcement. He would say, kids, we're going to Mexico. Uh, next week, get three months' worth of homework from your teachers. So there I go running to school, about a mile and a half. Nowadays, we make you guys walk to school a mile and a half. You know, we get arrested for child endangerment. But in those days, it was okay. <laughs> I get to school, and I tell Miss Young. I say, Miss Young. And she says, yes, Jose. I say, we're going to Mexico. Can you give me three months worth of homework? And she just rolled her eyes. You know, cause, and you got to understand her frustration. She has been through that process with my three older siblings. This is the fourth time. I guess fourth time was a charm. So she says, you tell your parents I'm going to come home to your house and talk to them. Man, my eyes got this big. The teacher never comes to our house. <laughs> I was like, this can't be good. So there I go running back on a cheese man to tell the teacher, you know, and to tell my parents. And the first one I run into is my dad, when you know. And my dad's a stern, serious guy. If you're doing something bad, all he has to do is look at you, and then you stop dead on your tracks. So my dad just got out of work, kind of tired and grumpy. And so I, tell, I get in the living room and say, hey, Dad. I said, yes, son. I said, the teacher's coming over. She wants to talk to you. Man, I did not finish that sentence when he's already taking off his belt. <laughs> you see, my dad has a different view of the judicial system. <laughs> he likes to apply the punishment first and then ask what happened. <laughs> get the facts later. Yeah? And I don't know how I convinced him that it wasn't related to my behavior, but rather our trip to, upcoming trip to Mexico. He, you know, he kind of still doubted me. He said, you better be right, boy, because it's going to go twice as bad if it's a uh, complaint. Then I go to the kitchen to my mom. And my mom's completely opposite from my dad. You know, she's so nurturing, caring, and all that. And so she is making tortillas and rice and beans for us to eat dinner. And, uh, and I tell mom, I say, mommy, see, sí, mijito. I said, the teacher's coming over today. You guys ever see that movie, Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone? <laughs> that was her reaction. Teacher's coming, says, we got to clean the house. We got to sweep. We got to mop. You got to hide the broken dishware and get out the new one. And we got to make dinner. And, I mean, it was great because if you could, you know, we even had meat on the table. You just rice, beans, and salsa, and tortillas. This time, it, there was meat on the table. I mean, it was a banquet for me. So if you could imagine a table... You know, this is a second grader, right? A table with the family he loves. You know, Miss Young sitting next to me. She's my teacher, so she's sitting next to me. And we got this great meal in front of us. You guys ever, you know, when you have visitors and you have conversations and all of a sudden you get this awkward silence, you want to jump start the conversations? Well, I said, I'm going to jump to start the conversation. And I get this bright idea. I got to say something, you know, witty kind of thing. So I figure, there's my family. There's the food. There's Miss Young. Perfect for a second grader. World was perfect. I said, Miss Young. I said, Yes, Jose. I said, You ought to come over more often. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I hope she came every day. We're going to eat meat. You know, everybody laughed except my dad. <laughs> my dad gave me what we call the look, la mirada. The look is when you're by yourself as a family, and you misbehave on the kitchen table, on the dinner table, well, he doesn't hesitate to come and slap you one, right? 
But when you have gifts, they kind of hold back, huh? <laughs> so they do the next best thing. They look at you and say, wait till she leaves. <laughs> you and I are going to have a talk. In which case, your strategy is to prolong the visit so he forgets about it, right? <laughs> and, you know, nine times out of ten, it does work. But anyway, we eat, have a great dinner, and then we go and sit in the living room. And I get invited because my parents can't speak English and Miss Young can't speak Spanish. So what little English I knew, I was the official translator. And Miss Young sits down and she says, hey, thank you for the dinner. I really didn't come here for dinner. I really came to talk about your kids' education. And my, uh, and my, my dad uh, immediately gets in his defensive posture, right? He thinks the worst. He said, why, are they misbehaving or what, what are they doing? And Ms. Young says, no, no, no. She said, on the contrary, I've had uh, all of your poor kids in my class, because we made the same stops each year, and right now I have your youngest, Jose, and they all have a lot of potential. But this nomadic lifestyle of moving school district to school district, three school districts and missing three months of uh, school really hurts them. And my dad said, well, what do you mean? He says, I'm not like a typical migrant farm worker you know, even though I only have a third grade education, I believe in education. And Monday through Friday, they're, work, they're in school. Saturday and Sundays, sure, they're, they're working in the fields alongside me. And seven days a week during the summer, they work alongside the family. But Monday through Friday, they're in school. Yes, but you move three different school districts. Ah, but they're in school. Yes, but you go three months to Mexico. Ah, but they take homework. So my dad had an answer for everything, right? In his eyes, he was meeting the obligation his obligation of giving an education to his kids. Miss Young was clearly flustered. And, uh, and so she said, well, let me give you an example. Maybe this will help you. And I gotta hand it to Miss Young. She came up with a brilliant example. First, she builds up my dad. She says, you who have worked in agriculture all your life, surely you're an expert in, in these type of topics, these things, and my dad, you know, immediately says, well, I'm not sure I'm an expert, but yeah, I've worked all my life in this. <laughs> That's great, she says, I'm gonna give you a problem and I, I know you're gonna be able to help me answer this, 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 this question. And my dad said, I will try, Miss Young. So imagine, Mr. Hernandez, that I give you four fruit trees, small fruit trees in pots. My dad said, yes. I said, I want you to find the most fertile ground. I want you to dig four holes, and I want you to plant those trees. Make sure you water them and fertilize them. Make sure they have everything they need. My dad said, yes. Three months from now, I want you to dig four new holes, same fertile ground. I want you to transplant those trees. My dad said, yes, wondering where is this going. <laughs> and then she said, three months from then, I want you to keep doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, every three months, I want you to transplant those trees into a new set of holes. And make sure you water and fertilize them. Make sure they have everything. So you're an expert in agriculture. Tell me, what happens to those four trees? My dad started thinking, said, said well, Miss Young, the trees aren't going to die. But I will tell you this, the roots never grow deep. So you're going to stunt their growth. And if they're fruit trees, they probably won't even bear fruit. Then you can count the seconds, 1,001, 1,002. And you see his facial expression change. He got it. He got the message. Those four trees represented his four kids. He said, oh, is that what you meant? And to his credit, he accepted that. He said, thank you, Miss Young. That year, we still went to Mexico. But a funny thing happened on the way back. As we drove back, we didn't stop in Southern California. We didn't stop in Central Cal California. We went straight to our last stop, Northern California, Stockton, California. And that's where we started to uh, get traction with our education. Because now our trips to Mexico from then on, just one stop in, in California, our trips to Mexico were now three weeks centered around Christmas vacation. Our education started to get traction. Still, I was still a farm worker, family of a farm worker. So the question that begs to be asked is, how the, in the heck does a 
farm worker kid even dared to dream to want to be an astronaut. And that dream, that dream was born when I was all of 10 years old, 1972, last Apollo mission. I'm 54, so you guys don't have to do the math. Okay? <laughs> 1972, I was 10 years old. And if you can picture a kid watching an old vacuum tube technology black and white TV with rabbit ear antennas on top, watching the very last Apollo mission, Apollo 17. Still remember the astronaut Gene Cernan walking on the surface of the moon as a 10-year-old holding the antenna to improve reception. And there I am listening to Walter Cronkite, the reporter, narrate. Then I would go outside, moon was almost full, I would look at it, come back inside, and keep watching, and said, wow, that's what I want to be. I want to be an astronaut. The best thing I could have done that day was I shared that dream with my dad. As we were walking, home, as we were walking to go to bed, to the bedroom, my dad was in front of me, I was behind him, and I said, hey dad, all excited. I said, yes, son. I know what I want to be when I grow up. What's that, son? I want to be an astronaut. Man, he almost trips. He stops dead in his tracks, puts his hands on his waist, challenging tone. He says, you want to be what? And I was so excited, I wasn't about to back down. I said, I want to be an astronaut. He said, son, let's go to the kitchen. Man, my eyes got this big. Only three things happen in the kitchen. <laughs> That's where we do our homework every day after school. My mom sits us down, you know, makes us our tortillas, our, our beans and rice, and we eat and we do our homework. Okay? Number two, that's where we eat dinner as a family. Both those things were done. Number three, that's where they apply punishment. <laughs> so now you know why my eyes got that big. So anyway, he sits me down, same chair where I do my homework, and he says, now tell me, why do you want to be an astronaut? Of course, I was fresh from listening to Walter Cronkite, so I had all the facts and figures. So I said, well, Dad, I can't believe that we as humans can take a person to the surface of the moon, a quarter million miles away, and bring him back home safe and sound. I want to be part of that. He looked at me, and he must have saw the determination of a 10-year-old boy, because what he told me afterwards is what really surprised me. He looked at me, and he said, son, I think you can do it. More importantly, he said, if you want to do it, you need to follow five simple steps. He said, I'm going to give you a recipe, five ingredients. If you follow these ingredients, I guarantee you you'll get to your goal. At that point, I become a sponge, dry sponge, ready to absorb everything he's going to say. I said, what are they, Dad? He said, first, decide what you want to be in life. What does Jose want to be when he grows up? I want to be an astronaut. Second, recognize how far you are from that goal. I looked at run at our two-bedroom, rented, dilapidated house in in a not very good neighborhood. I said, Dad, we can't be any farther than this. <laughs> he said, he laughed, said, good, I'm glad you recognize this. Because third, he says, you need to draw yourself a road map from where you know where you're at, given by your smart remarks, you do, to where you want to go. Because that's going to guide you in life. I said, what's the fourth, Dad? Education. He said, there's no substitute for good education. No shortcuts. Fifth and final, he said, so you know that work ethic you put out on weekends uh, in the fields, picking cucumbers, cherries, tomatoes, grapes, peaches, pears, and seven days a week in the summer? I said, yeah. That same work ethic pointed to my books. You put it here. And then he said, then when you graduate and you get a job, you put it in your job. He says, always Always give more than what people ask for. I remember going to sleep that day because I said, wow, 
<laughs> my parents think I could be an astronaut, ergo, I'm going to be one. And I never looked back since. I went to college, went to graduate school, started working at Lawrence Livermore Lab. As soon as I could, started putting in my application. I would add one other ingredient to that five ingredient recipe. And that's the sixth ingredient. That's perseverance, never giving up. I'm here to tell you, NASA rejected me not once, not twice, not even four or five times. It was 11 times. It wasn't until my 12th attempt that I got accepted to the 19th class of astronauts. So you can't give up. During those attempts, I found out there's three stages to reaching the goal. First is minimum requirements. If you want to be a doctor, you know you got to go to med school and pass the boards. Lawyer, law school, pass the bar. Astronaut, science degree, advanced degree, get experience, start applying. But then I found out that after six rejections, I was doing something wrong. I had to find out what I was doing wrong. So I compared myself with the astronauts. That's the second stage. Compare yourself to people you want to be like. And I found out that they were all pilots. I wasn't a pilot. So guess what? I learned how to fly. Another year, they were all scuba divers. I wasn't a scuba diver. Guess what? I got scuba diver rated. Basic, advanced, <laughs> scuba rescue, master scuba. I want to make sure NASA knew I knew how to scuba dive. <laughs> third year, third, third time, that's when I discovered the third stage is you got to do something that distinguishes you from the competition. So when I was working at Lawrence and Moore Lab. When a job came to work in Russia in the nuclear nonproliferation arena, no one wanted to do it because it was tough duty going to Siberia. I said, put me in, coach. I'll go. Why? Not because I wanted to get to know Siberia in the middle of winter. <laughs> but I had read that the US and Russia had signed an agreement to build what was going to be the International Space Station. And I put one and one together. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out, but I, even though I am one. But, but uh, I, I said, we're going to be working with the Russians in the future. So it behooves me to get experience working in Russia, Russian culture. More importantly, go to my boss and say, hey, can I have a Russian language instructor? So yeah, up in my Yuparuski Yazik. I know enough Russian to, to get drunk, I guess. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I know enough Russian. <laughs> Anyway, these, these are the things that you got to do in life to pursue your passion, your dream. And that's what I did. And I'm here to tell you that six ingredient recipe with the three stages I just gave you really do work. I got selected in 2004, trained for two years, got our wings in 2006, got assigned to a mission in 2007. And we flew it in 2009. I was the flight engineer for STS-128, a resupply mission to the International Space Station. If you don't mind, I'd like to show you a short five-minute uh, video that summarizes that mission. We launched in the middle of the night, almost midnight. And uh, it only takes eight and a half minutes to get up into space. You go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. That's our mission patch. Three engines light up first, and then, of course, a solid rocket booster. We're aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. Solid rocket boosters are only on for two and a half minutes, then they pop off, uh, fall to the ocean with parachutes, and are recovered because they're reusable. The center tank keeps feeding the three engines for another six minutes. Total flight, powered flight time of eight and a half minutes. And there, eight and a half minutes, uh, we're up orbiting the planet once every 90 minutes. There you see me giving a thumbs up because I consider myself now a bona fide astronaut. <laughs> Our crew was an international crew. Here's Krister Fuglesang opening up the uh, payload bay doors to initiate radiator cooling, uh, one of the first duties once we're up in space so we can uh, cool our electronics. 
there's yours truly uh, putting together the portable onboard computer systems that are going to help us uh, dock to the International Space Station while other people uh, put the cycle ergometer together so we can exercise our legs. Our crew was a mixed crew. This is my colleague, uh, Nicole Stott, female engineer, looking through binoculars of what's going to be her home for the next three months. Uh, one of our objectives is to take her up there and leave her there and bring some, well, someone home who's been up there for three months. Our second objective is to, uh, is to uh, uh, deliver more than seven tons of equipment uh, and supplies to the International Space Station. We did that via the, uh, the module, MPLM module Leonardo, which is uh, what you see there in the payload bay door, in the payload. And then um, our third objective was to conduct three spacewalks. There we are celebrating after successfully docking to the International Space Station. That allows us to open up the access hatch through the docking port rings. And uh, the, the, the station folks do the same thing. Now we got this neat little tunnel that transfers us from the, uh, from the shuttle to the International Space Station. The other side, uh, Gennady Padalka was the uh, commander. Uh, six astronauts waiting for us, uh, and seven of us, total of 13 astronauts representing five countries. Tru truly an international affair. And they're happy to see us, not because we're good buds, but, but they've been up there for months and they know we have fresh fruit and vegetables. <laughs> As, uh, as flight engineer, I was one of the two principal robotic arm operators, along with Kevin Ford there, our pilot. Uh, and uh, we, there you see us grapple the MPLM, uh, put it on a docking port that allows us to open and have access to it. And while we're putting on everything together from the seven tons of equipment and installing it inside the station, other astronauts like Daniel Olivas are conducting uh, spacewalks. We conducted three spacewalks. Uh, one of the big items there at the end of the end effector is a ammonia tank that we installed for uh, radiator cooling and then we installed a, a spare one as well. Uh, and I was operating the robotic arm during that period, so taking them from place to place. After about uh, 12 of the 14 days up there, uh, we, uh, we undocked from the, station, from the station and there you can see the station's as big as a football field. We do a rotation maneuver and then head That's home. Good. You can see the, uh, as you enter the atmosphere, gravity starts taking hold little moment. by little. Uh, the shuttle is truly a versatile piece of machinery. It's amazing. It takes off as a rocket, becomes a spaceship, and enters as an airplane, a glider, if you will, because we only have one chance, one chance at landing it. It's not powered flight. We're just falling out of the sky in controlled fashion. Weather was bad in uh, Florida, so we landed in Southern California at Edwards Air Force Base. As I tell our, uh, our, our pilot, Kevin Ford, very important to put the wheels down. And this was better than my landing over here at Dulles Airport yesterday. I mean, CJ Sturkow, our commander, he's an amazing marine pilot. There he is. And that's a typical 14 day, that's a typical 14 day mission to the International Space Station. And one of the things I, I, wanna, I wanna leave you with, that I think it's very important, is just to go over the, uh, the recipe, especially for the students, and, and the three stages to reaching a goal. And I think uh, it's very simple. You know, it, 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 the first thing you gotta do is you gotta decide what it is you wanna do in life. Identify that, okay? You gotta recognize how far you are from that goal. You gotta draw yourself a roadmap that's gonna guide you and not only uh, point the way, but how to get there. You gotta study and prepare. No substitution for an education. And you gotta prepare yourself. And you gotta develop a work ethic second to none. You gotta work hard for it. If you really want it, you gotta work hard. And then the sixth ingredient that I added is perseverance. Never, never, ever give up on yourselves. We're our own worst enemy at that. We give up on ourselves. And then follow the three stages of reaching that goal is Recognize what are the requirements to get there. And then study people that are there already and find out what qualities they have and start acquiring them, just like I did. I knew they were pilots, I became one. I knew they were scuba divers, I became one. And third thing, 
Start doing things that's going to distinguish you from the competition. You know, cream always rises to the top. You know, you be that cream. Rise to the top and take advantage of opportunities that's going to make you uh, distinguish yourself. Take risks, calculated risks. So I think if you use that, mix all that up, just like my father told a 10-year-old uh, a while back, you follow that recipe, I guarantee you, you guys can reach for your own stars. Thank you very much. Please feel free. Feel free to follow me at, uh, I got Twitter, Astro underscore Jose. And I'll put a shameless plug. I also have a book called Reaching for the Stars, when you know it. But uh, I, I, I encourage all of you to read it because it's the how-to there, okay? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. for Diana. Um, I can honestly say this is one of the many reasons why I love my job. You hear that? <laughs> I tell everyone I love my job. And so we're going to go ahead and transition over to um, Q&A, question and answer portion of the program. Um, and we will be uh, taking questions from the audience. So feel free to you know, ask any questions of both our speakers. If I could have both of our speakers, please. Um, Join me on stage, that would be wonderful. We do have some people in the audience with mics. Um, can I see the people with the mics? Okay. <laughs> so if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and one of them will come, um, come and get you. Uh, we'll go ahead and open the floor up. I see a question back there. <clears throat> Don't be shy. Okay, um, right here. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I want to know what personally is a way that you can advocate, you can push for diversity in your workplace. And, uh, well, that's it for now. Okay. Well, it, what I think, um, the best thing
transmission, and then with the nuclear power, we can last as long as the power stays there. So for example, MER, the Mars Exploration Rovers, they have been there, or one of them at least is, is still there, that is currently operating at a very low uh, power. So to answer your question exactly, it all boils down to, can you talk to the rover? Is there a way that you can power on the rover, even at the bare minimum, to still communicate to it and then bring the data back? Now, with respect to the material, you do need to send material that will, that will be durable, but at the same time, that is not too heavy, because it costs a lot of money, and every pound that you put on that rover is going to be more expensive, but you still have a, a, an objective with that mission. So you have to do those trades. To give you an example, the wheels of the rover itself are made of aluminum, so material that it will be durable, but at the same time, light. So um, we try to squeeze every single piece of juice that we can get out of the rover, even if you can power on and take a picture and turn it down and power it off immediately. That's still something that you can get science out of. Thank you. I'll take a question right here. Hi, so it's, uh, um, it's really wonderful to hear stories from Jose. Wonderful of you to take us on your journey to the space station. I was Nicole Stott's backup for Thank that you. mission, so it was if I was going. And Diana, when all the all the things that you showed, especially the the TV images, you know, the places where we feel like maybe that could be me. I was an I dream a genie person too, and it <laughs> wasn't about the <laughs> about the genie. Uh, I'd like to ask you for something more subtle, um, a, a recipe for something a little more subtle. Is I think that when you look different, like we do, it's easy to be seen, but also actually not quite to be seen. People think they know who they see, but there's more there than often they can really get to unless you bring it to them. And so, and this is a little bit more for the NASA audience or the, um, you know, in a meeting when either you feel like people aren't really understanding what you might bring or you see someone at the table that you realize that people aren't seeing them. Can you give people some practical recipes or bullets for those things? Well, I think, um the, the the first thing the first thing is um, you as an individual and uh, and are at a workplace and you say hey you know I really I want to sort of not just blend in and 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 not get if you will recognize or or, or be picked up by somebody or or t taking someone under his arm is the thing that I would do is is first of all is is if I see an individual who has that promise. Is I would you know set up a mentoring program either with myself or with somebody else that's in a closer uh, age group or, or 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 area of interest and 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 set up that mentoring so that that person starts expanding a little bit their horizons and get exposed to other people as well because it's real easy to be in a big organization and you fall into a little narrow cubicle that all of a sudden you get lost in the hustle and bustle. But, but you know, expand the horizons in that sense. And, and as managers, our, you know, our job is to identify this talent and to nurture it and help it grow. As individuals, our job is to say, how can I grow and start adopting those measures? And how can I network and start networking so that you get out and, and you expand your little circle of, uh, of comfort to make it bigger? And from my perspective, as an individual, um, I think that it's recognizing in my mind that although we are from, we have different backgrounds and we come from different cultures or different countries, um, that actually is beneficial. Instead of seeing it as a, oh, we're not the same, we don't look the same, I don't speak English that well, I made mistakes with my grammar, because I do. Instead of actually thinking about that, what I focus on is on the fact that, you know, you bring something to the table when you have to figure out how to um, bring food home or how many jobs you need to work to get through education or those sort of stuff. You start developing that mentality of how do I get to my goal on the most efficient way, fast enough, and it doesn't cost me a lot. And so that sort of mentality that you start creating and cultivating is the sort of mentality that in a meeting where you're talking about we need to do you know, we need to deploy the arm and take three pictures and put it back inside, and we don't have enough power. How are we going to do that? Where do we park? And it just, it just comes to you. It's like, wait a second, I think that we can do it this other way. 
because it's something that you have developed through the years as somebody with a different background, because everyone has different struggles, and all those struggles can come together in a single moment. Now, when you are in meetings, I completely agree with you. Um, it's about the mentoring. It's recognizing that, yes, everyone has their talent and they're brilliant. They're working for NASA. That's why they're part of the team. But it is more of a, not everyone will be as talkative or you know, they don't come forward that often. So it's also talking to them, getting that mentoring going, making sure that they understand how to develop themselves on the job. And sometimes I've, I think that at least for me, it was a so excited that I'm part of this team. I don't want to mess it up. So I don't know where to start or what to say or what not to say or how to even navigate or what the options are. I mean, the option was to get to NASA. Now I'm part of NASA. So now what? And so it's, it's that thing of recognizing that they, like me, were scared probably at some point of do you come out of your cocoon and demonstrate the person that you actually are. Wonderful, thank you. I see a question from the gentleman back there. Which part of the International Space Station do you usually fix the most? Thing that you usually fix the most. Oh, w usually fix the most? Uh, usually, sometimes, uh, you know, you've got these false signals for air leaks, uh, and so you gotta work, work the protocol whenever you get an alarm system and a big alarm that says, hey, you got a leak. Uh, so, so that's usually one, one of the ones. The, um, the recycling of all the moisture the, the International Space Station uh, collects uh, sometimes is, uh, is, it, uh, breaks down and so they have to fix it. Those are the things that usually is the, the things that are used in a continuous basis. Yes, go ahead. How many times did you went to space? You know, uh, unfortunately, I only went once in 2009. When I got back, I got the news that uh, NASA was going to retire the shuttle fleet. And there were four more missions assigned after our flight, and that was it. And, and they already had astronauts assigned to those missions, so I knew I wasn't going to fly again. And I'm a big believer of history, and that history repeats itself. So I said, hmm. When's the last time we retired a, a, a vehicle and put a new one on, in line? Well, it was when I was 10 years old, uh, Apollo 17, 1972. And it wasn't until nine years later, 1981, that we had the maiden flight for the uh, space shuttle. So I did math in my mind. I said, OK, they're going to retire in 2011, 2012, nine years. That's 2020. I'm going to be how old? So I said, you know what? I'm going to get out while the getting's good and, uh, and, and leave on a high note and, and, and do uh, go on to other challenges. OK, go ahead. <laughs> um, around how long did it, uh, around how much time in college did you spend to be able to become an astronaut? Well, the, uh, first of all, you need a, a, a degree a technical degree, whether it's science, engineering, medicine, uh, whatever, undergraduate. Uh, it's good to have a graduate degree, master's, and it's great to have a PhD. Uh, and then you want to work in, in an area like at NASA or a, a, a contractor that, that, uh, that works in the space industry so you can get the experience, and then you start applying. It's a very competitive process. I think this uh, go around more than 18,000 folks that meet the minimum requirements are applying. And so, uh, so you just got to be patient, and uh, you got to keep trying, and follow my recipe, and I'm, I'm sure you'll get there. It takes a few years, but they fly by. Exactly. <laughs> yes, please. Do you ever get scared, like, in general, about what you're doing? <laughs> I do. I do. I do because you have a lot of responsibility. You're, in my specific case, as mission lead, um, we're making uh, decisions as to where are we going to drive, where are we going to unstow the arm, what, what rocks are we going to touch, is the vehicle stable, are we going to unstow it, and something is going to happen that we cannot fix. And so we want to make sure that everything that we do with the rover 
we do it safe so that we can continue to do science with the robot. But I do get scared because I sometimes wonder, are we making the right decision? And not because we don't have the information, but because you don't know what's going to happen. You could unstow the arm and think that you are okay, and then something else happens. So um, I do, but the good news about it is that we are trained to do the job that we, we are doing at that moment. So we're doing the best that we can. We're trying to make sure that we're assessing the situation, that we're making the right decisions. And at that point, you had give it, you had give it all. You had give it everything that you know to the best of your ability. So you have to trust that you, things are going to go OK. But at the next day, the first thing I do is check that it actually did go well. Um, it, you know, human spaceflight, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. It's certainly not routine. And um, I know when I finished my basic training, uh, after the first two years, my technical assignment was to uh, work as a Cape Crusader, uh, which meant I was part of a four astronaut team that went one week before a launch, and we basically lived inside the shuttle, calibrating, setting up the equipment, setting everything up. And my biggest concern wasn't for me, it was actually for my crewmates in the sense that, you know, unfortunately my face was the last one they saw before we closed the hatch. Uh, but more importantly was the fact that, did I put the switch in the right position? Did I do this? Did I do that? Things that can affect uh, the outcome of a mission and seven lives on board. I mean, that's what scared me the most is, man, I better not make a mistake. Um, the only other time I could remember that I would say, yeah, maybe I was a little scared, was when we were getting ready for launch. Uh, and if I can just walk you through that, you're sitting back on your back, and uh, you reach down, a countdown to zero, you, the three engines start, you hear them, you feel a gentle vibration, and you say, okay, we're getting ready to go. And then like two seconds later, the solid rocket boosters turn on. Man, all of a sudden the noise level goes up in order of magnitude, the vibrations, a violent vibration, and, uh, and, and, uh, and just as you think this whole thing's gonna fall apart, uh, it leans a little bit and you feel the push and you're off to the races. And I think at that point is when it leaned like that, that's when I said, oh, what the heck's happening? <laughs> but, Everything turned out all right. I came back and lived to tell about it, so. I think we have time for one more question, or one or two. Uh, uh, gentleman in the back, Hi. yes. My name is William, I'm from, Nor I attend Northwestern High School. One question I got for y'all is, what are the different internships or opportunities or programs that y'all have for kids or age to follow STEM careers or how can you find those opportunities? Okay, well, for, for NASA, uh, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, we, we, we've got the associate director here, Don James of Education. Uh, but if you, if you just log on to nasa.gov, uh, and you'll see there, there's internships, there's fellowships, there's MUREP, there's a bunch of programs out there uh, that, uh, that NASA has that gives opportunity all the way from high school to uh, uh, postdoc opportunities for the kids. And, and I encourage you to look at that website. There's ways to sign up for it and, uh, and fill out applications. So, uh, so visit nasa.gov. Absolutely. And you wouldn't believe how many there are. Amazing amount of opportunities. Just to give you an example, I work at JPL, and when the summer comes, there's so many interns that come to JPL that we can't even find parking. And in fact, they told us, they, in some cases, they're asking us to work from home so that the interns could actually come to campus and actually do their thing. So I think that what I'm trying to tell you is that when I was on your shoes, I will be thinking, well, I, yeah, there's internships, but maybe not enough. Maybe they're very selective. And yes, you have to be talented and bright, but there's so many. They're an incredible amount. Yes, and it, pretty soon you'll be hearing from Mr. Donald James. We specifically asked him to come in today because we wanted you all to get a better understanding of the opportunities that are out there and future opportunities as well. Um, young lady right here, please proceed. When you were in the middle of pursuing your dream, were there people who were being negative they're saying you can't do it, and 
if there were, how did you go through it? Great question. Uh, you are absolutely. I mean, uh, there's always the naysayers, right? And uh, and and the thing, uh, and people would also tell me is, uh, wow, didn't you get frustrated, uh, rejected 11 times? Uh, no one likes to get it rejected. I, I mean, I admit that. But I looked at it, you know, I looked at the glass, not half empty, but half full. Because I would look at it, I said, you know, what's the worst that could happen if I don't get selected? Well, because I shot so high to be an astronaut, I said, well, that forced me to go to college, get an engineering degree. It forced me to go to graduate school. It forced me to work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I, had, I was having a great career. So the consolation prize was, I'm going to be a great engineer. Not too bad of a consolation prize. So the moral of that story is, it's not the destination that's important. It's make sure you're going to enjoy that journey. Because that's where you're going to spend 95% of your time, is that journey. So enjoy the journey. From my perspective, yes. There, was, there were, you will find people that probably will think that you're not going to be able to do what you want to do. But I think that you have to also recognize that probably it's because you're shooting for something that people around you didn't even consider was possible for them. So when you're going for something that people around don't even think is possible, Yes, they're going to probably say, oh, that's, you probably are not going to get that done, or you're probably not going to get there. Just to tell you a story about mine, when uh, I was going to apply for NASA, I called my parents, and I told my dad, I'm going to apply for NASA, and he couldn't believe it. He actually was, again, concerned. He said, I don't, are you sure you, don't want, you want to apply for it? Because you're going to get rejected, and probably this is not a good fit for you. So I think that... My advice to you will be to believe in what you want to do. If you have a clear understanding of this is who I want to be, maybe you haven't figured out how to get there, but if you know who you want to be, then you have to just grab that and believe that you're going to do it. Find a path. And it doesn't matter what's going on around you. If people think you're not going to do it, you will find a way. There's lots of people around me that help me. There's lots of people that I talk to that I mention to them what I wanted to do. They were the ones that said, well, do this, try this, don't do that. So you will find people that will help you, but you just have to believe on what you want to do. Um, can I add a little something? Um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, also, I think the uh, importance of mentorship and finding uh, people that believe in you is also very important because sometimes I feel like, especially Hispanics or Latinos, you don't necessarily have, you know, people to go to, like, you know, Diana mentioned, people that look like you or that, you know, um, that, that can relate to you. So I think it's very important to um, try to find mentors or people that actually believe in you. Sometimes people that believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Am I right? Can I add something, Maria? Um, and don't wait for the mentor to come to you. You have to reach out to them. Yeah, seek There's them out. so many times that I've gone to the person and say, hey, I want to do your job in a few years from now or many years from now. Can you please mentor me? Can you sit down with me? And honestly, I currently I have five mentors. And all of them, I talk to them about different things. So don't, don't think that you have to limit the amount of people that you have to talk to. And don't expect them to come to you. Just feel free to go to them. You wouldn't believe how excited they actually get. They actually tell you, well, I actually did this, and don't do that. Do this instead. It's actually quite helpful. OK, I was notified that apparently there's a few questions, but I'll go ahead and um, I'll open it up to, to maybe two more. Yes, proceed. Hi, my name is Chris, and I also attend Western High School. And in terms of worth ethic, what do you guys personally think is the best strategy to getting an objective or task done efficiently and correctly? Oh, uh, how to get the task done? Uh, well, I mean, I think the, the important thing is before you even start working on it, is you develop a strategy of how you're going to get that task done. Sometimes it's uh, the most important part is before you even start work, working on a task, is the planning of it, how you're going to execute it. Uh, lots of times we're eager beavers and we want to jump right in 
and start working on it without having a strategy. It takes, it, you know, it, it, you feel like you're going to get delayed by doing this planning at the front end, but believe me, you'll be finishing a lot quicker than the person that didn't do the pre-planning. So pre-planning before execution, I think is the smartest way to go. I think so too. And I think that interesting because I have a team of us of at least five to eight different systems engineers that work on the mission. And they're the ones that are the tactical downlink lead personnel. The, uh, the average age of my team is in between, it's approximately 22 years old. And one of the things that I look about it the most is that um, the plan. If I talk to them and I ask them to please do something, um, I think that what it matters is for them, or in this case for you, to understand what is the final goal, and then think about how you're going to get there, and talk to the person that is asking you to do the task, or in this case, if it's a project of yours at school, go back to your professor and, or your teacher and be like, hey, I know you asked me to do this. This is the goal that I think I understood you asked me, and this is what I think I should do to get there. It will save you a lot of time. And also from the teacher's perspective or your professor, the person that you're working for, from their perspective, is another chance for them to either correct or redirect or help you even more and give you more resources. So I think I know where you're coming from. When I was starting to work for NASA when I was coming out of college, you're so eager to demonstrate that you can add value. And so you want to jump the gun and just start running it. But um, I think that is more valuable to demonstrate that you can think about the plan and you have a goal to get to it and then get that back and forth. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Lucy Macias. Um, we, are, we run a youth development program um, at Northwestern High School. We are La Clinica del Pueblo. Um, so I, um, the youth that we work with come from limited resources. Their families try to support them but maybe just cannot. Um, so our job is to try to motivate them to continue on, you know, getting an education or just believing in themselves. Um, but a lot of times we have a lot of obstacles that um, prevent us from trying to keep the youth mo motivated. So how do you think, what was a way that mentors um, were effective to you and how do you think is a good way to reach um, youth that have a lot of um, obstacles in their way? Okay, um well, I, I think first of all, in, in my particular case, even though my parents uh, only have a third grade education and we came from an economically disadvantaged family, they provided an environment that basically gave me the license to dream, to dream big and, uh, and be, and, and my dad gave me a recipe to provide, with, to uh, gave me the tools to convert that dream uh, into reality. Uh, along the way, I had teachers like Miss Young, uh, who, who helped uh, Mr. Ellis, Miss Bayo in high school, that were great mentors in math and science. And and so, from, uh, from to answer your question with respect to what you're doing at the school, I think it's great. I don't think it just has to be the parents. Uh, you know, I was lucky that my parents were very engaged, but I understand other parents aren't as engaged. And so, what do you do? Well, you become the substitute. You make them, you empower them to believe in themselves. And, and that's what great mentors do, is you empower the persons, your, your mentees, to uh, believe that they can achieve anything. And, uh, and, and by doing so, I think you, you basically are, are providing what role my parents provided. Uh, and we all know that, you know, even though it's, uh, I was economic disadvantaged, I think that was the secondary issue. And the first issue is, hey, believing that I can do that. Uh, the second is, okay, how am I going to pay for this? And that's when you start working two jobs and, and take out student loans and all that, but there's an answer to all that. Uh, the, the great thing is, let's get them there first. And I think you'd be providing that mentor uh, role and giving them that life as a dream is the best thing. Um, I think that for me there were two things that maybe I will recommend. Uh, one of them is, that's absolutely right. At the start, you know, when you're coming from a family of limited economical um, support, I think that it is more of a 
trying to latch to somebody that believes in them. I had a professor, actually, a teacher in my high school, my, chem my chemistry teacher, who I will do my homework very quickly or do my test very quickly, and then I'll feel kind of bad because I wasn't sure if I actually had done it right because I finished too quickly, and he will give me additional problems. So he will always come up, come to class with a new sets of problems, and that made me feel a little bit unique, actually. It made me feel like, oh, you actually believe in me. You don't want me to just stay there and wait until everyone else is finished, but instead you're pushing me even further. And you're asking me to push the boundary, even though maybe people around me are not pushing the boundary. It's not wrong that I want more, that, you know, that I need more. And so I feel like he trusted me, he believed in me, and sometimes it's hard also as the student. Like, I love chemistry, but you wouldn't believe I was really bad at physics. And so I was, I hated physics. But my professor actually was, my teacher was very involved with me and helped me understand how to take what he was teaching me in the paper, but actually making it more uh, physical, like by taking a ball or doing things with me that it will click in my head. So those sort of stuff. Now the other area I think that matters is the teachers made me feel like I could do something, but then I needed a little bit more. I needed somebody that were, was actually doing it. That relationship between understanding, I want to do that, but if anyone actually does that, does that person even exist? Do they look like me? That sort of stuff. So I think that I will also recommend probably is having guest teachers come to your class and have them tell them the story and then have the opportunity for them to ask questions of like, what did you do? Or questions that the students are asking us today. How did you manage? Did you feel scared? Did you have any concern? How did you manage to do it? That those things together will be well. And I would just like to say, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it's amazing. Um, for me personally, I'm like the youngest of eight kids and second to go to college. So I actually never even thought about going to college. And it wasn't because of people like you who, who actually taught me to believe in myself and think about the possibilities that I'm here today. So the work that you guys are doing, amazing. So thank you for being here. Um, I think I have um, room for one more. Can I take sure. one more question? Absolutely. All right. Who gets the last question? This gentleman right there, yes. How did you get to Mars? <laughs> How will we get to Mars? So we first have to come up with a lot of technology that we need to develop and demonstrate that we can actually take people safely to Mars. It's very important to us to get to Mars, but it's more important that we can get there and come back in a safe manner. I think that uh, what we have to do is a series of missions that demonstrate that we can survive on Mars, that we have the technology that will keep us alive, we have the technology that could take us to Mars, the technology that brings us back. And then at the same time, think about the crew, right? The most important thing is that although we're exploring, we're going there as a team, as a united team. So we all have to be okay with each other, we all have to figure out how to work together, how to live together, a long journey, probably eight to nine. So I think that NASA itself and other companies are working to get us there, and uh, we can find a path as long as we all work together and we don't forget what the goal is. Does that path take us to the moon? <laughs> that will not be up to me to decide. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, why don't we uh, give our uh, speakers here a round of applause and thank them for being here with us today and taking your questions. Um, I would now like to ask that if they could take their seats, and I would like to now transition over and welcome our um, Associate Administrator for Education, Mr. Donald uh, James, and he'll be able to answer any and all questions you have in terms of resources and um, where NASA is in terms of our education platform. Thank you. I don't think I need the platform. <laughs> I'm really glad to see you. I'm really glad to see the students. Uh, much of what I'm going to say is directed at the students, so I, 
I hope it's helpful. But wasn't that just a cool way to start the day with Diana and Jose? I mean, I, I don't know about you, that was amazing to see that. Um, it's, it's always gratifying to me to uh, find uh, connections to people and uh, Jose and I discovered that, you know, we came from the same area in California, Stockton. Uh, my father moved there after he finished law school. He wanted to be a civil rights attorney. And uh, in Stockton, there were many brown people and black people who had civil rights issues. And I remember as a little kid, him talking about uh, the struggles of the farm workers and, and defending people who didn't have money and resources. So that was really my first introduction to people who uh, were not like me and people who were like me. Um, so it's really great to, to, have a, to have an amigo from Stockton, California. I actually spent most of my upbringing in Sacramento. I'm really glad to have the students here. Is this the first time you've been to NASA before? Raise your hands for this. Wow. Did you guys know that NASA headquarters was here in Washington, D.C.? A lot of times I ask people that question, they think it's in Houston. I don't know why they think <laughs> it's in Houston. Um, you know, we call the students who are out in the audience, we call you the Mars generation. And we say that because um, we actually have plans to send humans to Mars and actually bring them back in about 20 or 30 years. So if you add your age to 20 or 30 years, you're the perfect age to want to go to Mars. Who would actually like to personally go on a rocket and go to Mars and spend time there? I see people in the front, people in the back. All right. So, so that means that you're willing to, the person that you're sitting next to, you're willing to be in a spacecraft for about five or six months. Yes, and then you have to work on Mars for about a year and then you come back. So you're gonna be gone a long time. If you're still willing to do that, then uh, we, we have plans for you. The whole point of the work that we do in NASA education is to ensure that the things that NASA wants to do in 10, 20, 30 years from now, that we can accomplish by having the right people to do it. And it really is all about the people. There's no machine that's gonna do everything for us because somebody had to program the machine, someone had to fabricate it, someone had to design it. So if we don't have capable people like yourselves to do the kinds of exciting things that we envision doing, then we're not gonna be able to do it. And I don't know about you, but I just think the work that we do is just, it's just cool. I mean, we're discovering planets and we're, and there, maybe there's planets, how many people think that there's other planets out there that are just like Earth? And, and if there's planets just like Earth, then that may mean that there's life on those planets. And how many of you think that we're eventually gonna find out that there's life somewhere in the universe other than on Earth. I believe that. And I mean, can you imagine one day if we actually figured that out? Um, I mean, one of the reasons that we're on Mars is because we found out that, you know, there was water on Mars and it went away. Well, why did that happen? Maybe Mars had life at one point and maybe it's gonna have life again. And, and maybe that's what's gonna happen to Earth. It's just, that's why they call it rover curiosity because we're curious about all these things. It's just really cool. So. I just want to let you know that we are here to help you realize whatever dreams that you have. And I want to just spend uh, one second talking to the people that perhaps are not interested in, in this notion we call STEM. STEM is an acronym. We love acronyms at NASA. We have millions of acronyms. It stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And as you know, there are many science disciplines. Technology is about how you do things. Engineering, there's many disciplines. And math, we have a lot of disciplines. But I want to let you know that it's not all about STEM. For those of you who think that those disciplines are uninteresting, I want to let you in on a little secret. NASA hires about two to 300 people every year. And do you know most of those jobs are not, quote, STEM jobs? So my message to you is, if you're sitting out there and thinking, uh, I'm not gonna be able to do NASA because I'm not a STEM person, then I want you to think that again. Because we need accountants, we need writers, 
We need people who can speak. We need people who can do art. We need people who can buy things. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you could do. The question is, what is going to be your part in our journey to Mars? Because the journey, it's not all, I mean, I love astronauts. Some astronauts are some of my best friends. But you know what? They sit at the top of a pyramid of a lot of people. There are so many people that it took to get Mr. Hernandez into space that if they didn't have if he didn't have those people, he would be sitting here still dreaming about go to space. Yes, he's an unusual person and he did an unusual thing, but it takes tens of thousands of people in order to enable that. And not all of them go into space. So maybe you can be a part of the journey as well. I want to tell you a brief story about, uh, and I brought some things up here to, to share with you. We're gonna, I'm gonna see how many people can answer a couple of questions. I was recently in Guadalajara, Mexico. There was this huge conference. Anybody who's anybody in, in space goes to this conference. It's called the International Astronautical Congress. Maybe one day one of the students would be able to go there. And the first thing, and so this is in a different country, and even though I've been to Mexico before, I hadn't really been to this part of the country. And the very first thing that I notice, and I go to lots of conferences, and I don't think about a lot of the things you do, but you have to have a badge. You gotta have a badge to get into everything. So you have to have a badge to get in this conference. And the first thing I noticed when I got our badge is, I don't know if you can see it, but there's this beautiful colored lanyard that was handmade by somebody in Mexico for the thousands of people that came. And I just stared at that and I said, that is just the coolest thing. And, and what it did for me is that it reminded me that in our humanity there's people that are doing their part. So I don't know who actually made this lanyard for all the people, but somebody uh, put this together and they were doing their part to help all of us who are at this Congress feels special. And so I just thought this was really great. And the other thing they had is they had these backpacks. Now ordinarily when you go to conferences you get kind of a standard backpack and it has these logos of all the companies that donated money and things like that. And I thought this is just really cool. I mean, someone probably made that. And so I went up and I said, you know, I would like to have one of these backpacks. I think this is, looks really nice. And they said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. James. These are just for the students, not for the delegates. And I said, but I really want a backpack. <laughs> so just like Mr. Hernandez says, perseverance is really important. So um, I said, well, I'm a student because I'm always learning. And he said, <laughs> nice try. Uh, so I was standing in front of a group of students and I said, you know, I really want one of these backpacks really great. And here's one thing that I know about you students in the room. You have something that I really want. You have a backpack. And I think I have something that you really want. I have money. <laughs> so maybe we can work something out. So as it turns out, I actually didn't have to give somebody money. I actually had some cool NASA stuff. And so they really wanted some cool NASA stuff. And so I got a... I got a backpack. So, um, so I have a question to any of the students out there. By any chance, did anybody have a birthday last Saturday, October 1st? Any, any chance? What about close? Anybody in October? Yes, when's your birthday? Shout it out. The, what? The, September 30th, one day? All right, well, guess what? That's the day before October 1st, which is actually NASA's birthday. And so NASA turned 58 years old last Saturday, which means that you were born one day before NASA. So congratulations, when this is over, you can have my backpack from Mexico as my gift to you. All right, so let's talk about how do you get to work for NASA and do all these cool things. I'm gonna give you a couple of tips. Remember this, intern.nasa.gov on the internet. If you go to intern.nasa.gov, you can find out how you can be an intern. We mostly bring interns when you go to college and graduate school. Sometimes we do it for high school students. But intern.nasa.gov, that's how you can learn about uh, getting internships. We also do fellowships and scholarships when you uh, get up uh, in age. Um, we do other uh, programs and activities for those of you that might 
be interested in going to an Hispanic serving institution. An Hispanic serving institution is simply defined as any institution of higher education that has 25% uh, people of, of Hispanic background. And so NASA has special programs where we invest in those uh, universities uh, to support uh, uh, that uh, activity. So I, I want to close by telling you that um, if you are interested in anything that we are doing, we are here uh, to help you do that. And we, you just need to ask the question and, um, and ask people, uh, how can I accomplish this? This is what I'm interested in and how can I accomplish this? And if they don't give you a good answer, come to somebody else. And if all else fails, just email me and I'll help you out. But hurry up, you know, because I'm getting old and one day I'm going to leave and I may not be here and everything. But, but that's why we need you because a lot of us are getting old at NASA. If you actually look at the average age at NASA during the height of the Apollo program, we were about 25 to 27. Right now it's about 52. So there's this, this belt bow wave of of people that are flowing through NASA and eventually we're all going to end up in rocking chairs and we need somebody to build the rockets to get us to go to Mars and all that kind of stuff. And I'd actually like to see that before, what did you say, you go to bed? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> when you don't ever wake up, you know, so. Um, we, we, uh, we really are about trying to ensure that this country and this world, in fact, uh, can include people from all walks of life to um, participate uh, in this great adventure we call space exploration. Um, the question is, what role are you going to play? What part do you want to play? You don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't even have to be an associate administrator for education. You know, back in the Apollo days, if you were to walk the halls of NASA and ask the person who was the janitor, you know, what his or her job was, they would say, I'm working to get a man to the moon and bring him back safely. Because that's what we're all about, is, is a team on that. Um, I want to say a couple of things about some things you've heard today that I've thought about a lot. This notion of, of working hard and what does that actually mean? Because sometimes I don't know what working hard means. Does that mean you have to sweat and be in pain? Or what, you know, what does it actually mean? So I'd like to, to give you a suggestion. This is one of my tips. And I have a formula, too. And Jose has formulas. We all have formulas. We think in formulas at NASA. To me, it really means what are the trade-offs that you're willing to make in order for you to get the things that you want? Because every minute, every day, you are making choices. You chose to get up this morning. You chose to go to school. You chose to be here. Now, you may not think you had a choice, but you really did have a choice. Sometimes you make choices, and there's consequences for those choices if you make the wrong choice. So in many ways, I think when you talk about working hard, it's really about what sacrifices you're willing to make. So for example, if someone says, hey, we want to, we're having a pool party uh, this Saturday, and we really would like for you to, to come over to the pool party, and you're thinking, you know, I just, I didn't quite get that last algebra problem. I really want to go work on that, but that pool party sure sounds really great and all that kind of stuff. Well, you're at a choice. Do you want to go to the pool party or do you want to uh, work on your algebra? So it's up to you to decide at any given moment what's really important for you. So I think in terms of, of, of what sacrifices and trades there are. So um, I'm really glad that the students that are here and I hope that um, you really got a lot out of um, our speakers and I thank you for being here. And NASA is here. Uh, we have a model, we're with you when you learn. So let us help you learn and let us help you grow and be a part of our agency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. James. Hello, everyone. My name is Magdiel Santana, and I'm the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance co-chair here at NASA headquarters, and I want to thank everyone for participating today. Um, the Hispanic community is a very diverse, growing, and proud community, and today we are very proud of our two speakers, Diane and Jose, for everything you've accomplished and for representing our community so very well. 
So if Ms. Crystal Paquin could come up, we would like to present you with some gifts um, to express our gratitude today. For Ms. Diana, the plaque reads, for your exceptional contribution to the participation in the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance, OLA, celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month at NASA headquarters, October 4th. Thank you so much. Say as well, same thing, for your exceptional contribution to and the participation in the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance celebration today. The Hispanic community um, contributes to many aspects of our daily lives, and as you've learned today, our community has contributed greatly to science and space exploration. We are astronauts, doctors, program mission leads, judges, attorneys, doctors, surgeons, you can name it, and we all contribute to this great nation in a variety of different ways. <clears throat> the theme of today's program was Aspira con NASA, Aspire with NASA, and the focus and goal of today's program was to reach a little bit beyond just at NASA headquarters, and this is why today we are happy to have Northwestern High School and Grunston Middle School here with us today. Make some noise! <laughs> Did you guys enjoy the program? Are you all ready to knock out them straight A's? All right, good enthusiasm. <laughs> Success is when preparation meets opportunity. That's a very popular quote that I really like because it reminds us that in order for you to achieve success, you need to be prepared for those opportunities that come your way. And the way you can all start preparing right now is by making sure you're working on your, all your classwork, studying hard, and making sure you're taking your education seriously. So we encourage you and challenge you to make sure you're doing all those things. Dream big, stay focused, and don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do what you set out for yourself. <clears throat> also, on behalf of Ola, we'd like to thank several of our administration staff. We'd like to thank Administrator Bolden for his support, Krista Paquin, our champion, Jay Han, Aisha Moore, Donald James, Cindy Olivares, the CSSC graphics team, NASA TV, HQ Audio Visual Team, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, the Office of Communications, and the OLA Leadership Board, and all of the volunteers that helped put this program together. So thank you so much for everyone today. <clears throat> and on a personal side note, you guys all had a lot of tremendous questions. I, I'm also a product of the internship programs that the agency had. I've been an intern with the agency since high school and I went through college, and after I finished college, I was able to land a, a job here. So I encourage you to really go out there, do your research, get that GPA polished, keep it at least at a three, shoot four, four, but make sure you focus on your academics, and, we'll, and you'll be there. So that concludes today's program, and thank you very much. <clears throat>